I have an email here from Matt. And and I got a tickle out of this. I'm going to read it. And I sh I, I'm i laughing because some of the young folks don't understand the way that things used to work. So there's a couple questions that we can answer here in this email. Hi, Jim. I grew up watching 90s wrestling and have older siblings who were wrestling fans in the 80s but would only watch Jim Crockett slash WCW. I've recently been delving further into old territory tapes, including Mid-Atlantic and Mid-South. On a few episodes, there have been random inserts on other promotions telecasts of WWF footage featuring Andre the Giant. No preamble was given to explain these inserts, but I'm assuming that it was due to Andre attracting viewership if a match of his were advertised. Would this be done only if Andre was to be making an appearance in another territory, or would promotions, this is what tickled me, would promotions purchase tapes of Andre's WWF matches to air on their telecasts sporadically if they needed a bump in ratings? How did the WWF feel at the time about snippets of their tapings appearing on other territories' broadcasts? Regards, Matt. Oh, Matt, there's so much to, to go over here. Um, First of all, I, no promotion, no wrestling promoter, especially in the territory days, has ever purchased footage of somebody's matches to put on their television program to begin with. Many of them stole footage, uh, but nobody purchased tapes back in those days. And there was no bump in the ratings because, uh, Brian, I guess we've never said this out loud, but it, it, I guess people now wouldn't know this. The wrestling program, the regular weekly wrestling show that was on in your local hometown, whatever territory you lived in, on your local broadcast station, they never advertised any of the matches you were going to see ahead of time. O almost, unless, like Bill Watts, every once in a while, if he had a fucking angle he was going to shoot, he'd say, next week for the Mid-South Tag Team title, so-and-so is going to face so-and-so, or whatever. But for the most part, I can't even think of a time where it was advertised ahead of time in Memphis. Um... The whatever matches that you saw on the wrestling program, you first heard about when you were watching the open where the announcer said, hello, everybody, today we're going to see so-and-so. I'm, I'm not overstating that, am I? Can you recall in the territory days any but very sporadic, infrequent times they would promote a match uh, a week or two out on television? Very often they would promote the wrestlers. You know, next week, tune in, Tommy Rich will be here, plus this person and this person and this right. person. The matches, not really. I mean, the one Memphis example I was thinking of, and I couldn't remember it firmly happening, I'll ask you, Flair and Lawler in 82, did they promote the week before that Flair was, well, they wouldn't have promoted the match because they didn't know the match was going to take place. Until right. The angle, yeah. It was an angle. No, because that's the thing is that uh, uh, it w it evolved organically, the match that day. I can't even remember whether they had said the previous week that Flair was going to be on television or not. But you're right. Usually, I mean, Watts did it, and usually that meant something was going to happen. Like with the WWF during, or WWF during sweeps weeks, you would get main event matches, but like Bruno and Zabisco was built up on TV for a few weeks. So when it was next week, it was going to be Bruno and Zabisco. It had been built up, and that was the cue to, you know, we're going to do a big angle. We're going to do something right. really big yeah. here. <laughs> But no, I mean, typically they didn't. And of course, we'll, we'll get into it now with the Andre footage and footage coming out of the Northeast, why it was sent to the various territories. Well, it, the most famous Andre footage was the handicap matches that they sent. It was 1974. Andre had been appearing in certain parts of the U.S. for a couple of years since he'd come to to Montreal. He... um. Actually, uh, his first appearance, from what I was told by the building janitor, uh, Andre's first appearance in the United States was the old building, what was it, oh God, an auditorium or some type in Burlington, Vermont, because that was a spot show that they would run out of Montreal. And we were there for Raw in the 90s. And the old guy said, yeah, this was the first building that Andre the Giant wrestled in in the United States. But he'd also, because of... Um, uh, a deal that Vern had with the Vashans. He had worked some of the AWA towns in the Midwest and he'd been to Chicago and he'd been to Indianapolis, but he hadn't made a, a complete tour of the United States. And so when Vince senior signed him 
in 74 to an exclusive contract, he became Andre's booker and he started booking him out to the other territories, the other promoters. They would get dates on him. That kept him special as an attraction. And of course, Vince Sr. got a piece of it. And what they did was on the WWF TV tapings, they put Andre in against two or even three guys. I mean, there was uh, several tapes that they circulated of Andre doing Andre's spot, standing up with the guy when he had a headlock on him and the guy's feet wouldn't touch the ground and trapping the guys in the corner and giving them the big head butts of the butt bump. And then the, um, the double or even triple leg scissors where he'd mare the guys over and he'd have a leg scissors on all three of them. Then he'd pick them up and do the big butt bump. They did those matches and then Vince Sr. would send those tapes out for the local televisions of the different territories whenever he was booked in. So you saw those and, and the promoters would keep them. And then every time that Andre might come in, they'd show the same ones. So those were the original Andre matches that at one point or another were on almost every territory's TV in the country. You know which one makes me cringe? Like, it just, I hate that they did it with these guys. There's a handicap match from L.A. of Andre squashing Gordman and Goliath. Gordman and Goliath, yeah. That pains me. <laughs> That's pain, it pains well, me at this great tag team destroyed by Andre. But here, they did the same thing almost everywhere. Uh, Andre's first appearance in Louisville here and in, in most of the Tennessee territory was against uh, a, a heel tag team in a handicap match, Charlie Fulton and Bobby Maine, who had been the Mighty Yankees, I believe it was. Yes, they'd been the Mighty Yankees, but they got unmasked and they were leaving the territory. And Andre came in and beat both of them in the main event. And it was... All Andre matches were cold matches in those days, meaning that they didn't have any angle uh, behind them. And there was no grudge. There was no personal issue. It was just, here's Andre's coming in. And a lot of the territories, if they didn't have a big guy like Ernie Ladd or Don Leo Jonathan or somebody they could put Andre in in a single match, they had a heel team that was probably leaving the territory, so they'd put Andre in a handicap match against this main event heel team, and the people would be like, oh, shit. They were the tag team champions, and they did this and that, but they didn't know that they were on the way out of the territory, so they'd do a job to Andre, and they'd be gone, and it didn't hurt anything. Uh, but yeah, Gordman and Goliath, uh, classic example, but that was one of the you know classic tag teams of all time. The other one, Beyond Matches, the promo with Andre next to Vince, and Andre's on the crate, so he looks like he's 10 yeah. feet taller than <laughs> Vince. That went everywhere, too. Well, that, that's another thing. You saw more promos, and that used to be a big deal. When you would see a promo of a star that was coming in, that's another way that the promoters worked together is that if Ernie Ladd was finishing up in Florida, but he was going to be starting for Vince, they'd shoot interviews at the Florida TVs to send to Vince to air on WWWF television or whatever the territories were. So you saw promos being sent back and forth more often because the promoters were not competitors since they had their own territories and they knew that, it, okay, you know, you need a tape from me on so-and-so. Well, I'm going to need something from you one of these days. So it wasn't like they weren't breaking their necks to help each other out, but they would send tape and, and things like that. And another tape that was widely, and this is before home video, that when you had to definitely get your footage from the promoter that, you know, of, of the guy that's that, he you know, the promoter, the guy's been working for, because you can't just steal VHS from somewhere, right? There was no such thing. The 1977 NWA world title change between Funk and Harley Race in Toronto. That was not only taped for television for the Toronto and, uh, uh, TVs up there, but also they sent it around to all the NWA promoters and most of them ran it. That's how everybody got to see that title change. And normally here in Memphis and the Tennessee territory, they wouldn't have aired it except as new champion. And it was planned ahead. Harley had dates here in March, uh, uh, all over the territory. So they showed that to build up for Harley coming in. But that tape was circulated for quite a while, and it was good quality of footage. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, when when 
when I was running Smoky Mountain Wrestling or OVW, the WWF would send us tape. I'd call them and I'd say, hey, we've got the APA or we've got Big Show or we've got this guy or that guy uh, coming in for Six Flags or he's going to be here for a few weeks for the TV. So can you send me some matches down so I can promote him on the TV, show him uh, wrestling and or do a you know music video or whatever? Well, at first... <sighs> The the WWF people in the studio, they didn't really understand the wrestling business. And because the WWF had worked with so few outside promotions during the period of time that they were working there, this is, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, they didn't really understand. They didn't get a grip on it. They would send me matches with the talent that was coming in for me, but they'd cut off the finish because apparently it had been a rule... <laughs> that they were when they sent out footage to TV shows or news shows or whatever to promote appearances with their talent, they didn't want to see any WWF guys getting beat on television. So they sent me footage of the guys that I was trying to put over and promote, but cut off the finish without seeing them win the fucking thing, which is the whole reason to show the match. And when I called them, I said, the fucking footage is cut off. Oh, uh, that's that's what we're supposed to do. I finally, until I could get it straightened out and talk to Jim Ross, I think, get him to smarten him up, I was actually taking VHS tapes that I would record at my house of Raw and just pulling the fucking matches that I wanted of guys and putting them on OVW TV. Because why the fuck not, uh, since we're working with them anyway and training their fucking talent. But that was uh, it, they lost the fucking plot on why footage was sent from territory to territory to begin with. If you've got a star coming in and he's going to be starting on April 1st, if you got footage from his previous territory of just matches of him just beating people in five minutes on TV, then you could show that for a week or two or three out ahead of time. And he's, you know, he, he's he's made when he gets there. When the Midnight Express and I went to Mid-South Wrestling, we couldn't do that because Bobby and Dennis had not been together as a team and I wasn't their manager. So Watts flew us in a little over a month before we were supposed to start and had us do a match on each one of the five TV, actually flew us in twice, two different tapings. We did five TVs total of just us winning in three or four minutes to show before we actually started in the territory. If we'd had stuff from Memphis, we could have sent that, but we didn't, so we didn't. When when Smoky Mountain Wrestling and Memphis were working together we, with each other, we'd send tape back and forth. So it would just, you know, it, that's what territories used to do to help keep talent fresh and a constant flow and and juice up a guy's angle and and uh, a, or sometimes a star in a territory. It wouldn't have anything to do with promoter to promoter, but the star. I use him again, Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd might be at a. TV taping in Florida, but he might say, well, I'm going to work for Fritz in Dallas uh, next month. I need to cut a couple of promos. And they'd say, okay, Ernie, and they'd cut a couple of promos for him and hand him the tape, and he could mail it to fucking Fritz. You know what was sent around everywhere? And, you know, we know the reason why. Gorilla Monsoon versus Baron Sakuna with Muhammad Ali running in and getting the airplane yeah. spin from Monsoon. Yes. Um, they sent that everywhere because they they wanted to promote the Ali Inoki uh, you know, closed circuit uh, business, but at the same time, a lot of the promoters that didn't really care whether Ali and Anoki did any business or not, and maybe, you know, hadn't jumped into the closed circuit thing. They just wanted to see a wrestler beating up Muhammad Ali on their wrestling program because it made to the fans, it made wrestling look bigger. To tie it back to Watts, Watts, somewhat regularly brought Andre the Giant in, especially for big shows. So if you watch Mid-South TV, what exists and what doesn't currently exist on the network, but when he brought in, for the Superdome, you know, JYD versus Michael Hayes, he brought in Hogan versus Andre. Yeah. So that footage from New York aired of the build-up to that match, which then happened in Shea Stadium, what, later that week? And then when... He had Boy, Andre and Hogan had a pretty good week that week. They were a Superdome, Shea Stadium... Yeah. Fuck. And then in, I think, 82, when Watts had Killer Khan working for him, it was natural when Andre came in to book Andre and Killer Khan, so they aired that footage of 
I think when Andre was doing the promo on crutches and Fred Blassie and Killer Khan came out and attacked him. So regularly with Andre, especially with Bill Watts, he would air the Andre stuff from New York. Yeah. Well, and, and Watts also, Watts was way ahead of everybody else in booking main event matches on his television program. And you've seen the six mans out there. What was it? Andre, Dusty, and JYD against... The Samoans and Ernie Ladd. The Samoans and Ernie Ladd. And that was a television match. But uh, whereas the the primary rule was you don't give away main event matches on free television in those days a lot of the promoters went all in on that, like Vern Gagne. You know, there was one competitive match per year on AWA television, and it usually was an angle. And elsewise, it was squash matches and fucking promos. But Watts, with the the mind he had for finishes, and, and this was Florida. They did the same thing in Florida. You would see the Funks and the Briscoes in a TV match when business called for it, when they had something to to, to do. And as long as you were creative enough with finishes, Eddie Graham, Bill Watts, et cetera, you could have your main event match on television. You could ha- It could be a good match, and you could have a finish that would shoot off from that match, either make you want to see that match booked back in the arenas and pay to see it, or what he really did a lot was have a main event match and then do something in the finish to involve someone else or take it in a different direction. So the match he booked in the arenas might involve different people and he could save the rematch of what you just saw on television for a big show down the road. The very first Midnight Rock and Roll Express match that ever happened was on Mid-South Wrestling Television for free. And he told us flat out, he said, you got seven minutes, show them what it's going to look like. And then the Russians, who the rock and roll were working a program with to get over to come face us, the Russians ran in, did a DQ, and the Russians got some heat on the rock and roll, and it built their matches. But in the back of people's minds, because they just seen seven minutes of the midnight in a rock and roll, shit, we, we want to see some more of that. Wonder when that's going to happen. So he could use those main events to lead to better business rather than giving away matches for free and losing it. Bill Watts aired Lawler versus Andy Kaufman as a precautionary tale of why actors shouldn't get involved with wrestling. He didn't do do anything to build up the match or talk about Andy Kaufman. It was more like, look at what happens when one of these guys gets in the ring. You know, this guy's a joke. Look at this. Yeah. Putting down Andy Kaufman. Lawler shut him up. One of these Hollywood types that wants to knock wrestling. To the best of your knowledge, did any other territory air that footage? It was on Letterman, obviously, but I'm talking about the actual wrestling shows. I don't think so. Because, well, think about it. There was no reason for him to because most of them probably, Eddie Graham, I don't think, was going to book Andy Kaufman, Fritz Von Erich. That's why that Andy had to come to Memphis because Lawler and Jarrett were the only ones that would book him in, on a real wrestling show and let him do his stuff and figure out a way to where he didn't make the business look silly. Because, you know, I mean, watching it, watching it now, just watching the match, it still stands up as a match, and it looks like that Lawler probably could have fucking very well hurt him. But you don't understand that in the context of as it was happening at the time, the first big celebrity crossover where a, a, a celebrity, actually a non-athletic celebrity, just an actor, whatever, actually wrestled in a high-profile match, the one thing that the promoters wouldn't let happen. Vince senior wouldn't book him. Nobody wanted to make the wrestling business look stupid or fake. And it actually did more to make the business seem real than anything they did for the next 30 years. Because the way that Lawler was a genius at psychology and speaking and Andy Kaufman was a genius at psychology and speaking, he knew what he was doing. If he'd have been a fucking athlete, he could have been a wrestler. They made people believe this thing was legitimate. And I was there that night. The people, when when Kaufman was laying there in the ring, stretched out, they legitimately thought, and the, here comes the ambulance. The fans legitimately thought that Lawler had broken his neck and they were happy about it. And when he was on the stretcher, they were throwing garbage and balled up popcorn bags and fucking Cokes. Fuck you, you Hollywood fuck. That serves you right. 
they if if they could have without the cops there, the people would have actually come up and turned his fucking stretcher over. How many? And, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was I was just got that was that was the one thing that one would have thought would have exposed wrestling, but in instead. It did more to make people think, well, wrestling may be fixed, but that was real. I've told a story. My my uh, cousin's wife was the head nurse at the floor of the hospital that they took Kaufman to. And she came home at night. Oh, can you believe it? Holy shit. Lawler must have really hurt him. Be careful. They're always at me. Be careful. Anyway, you could get hurt. Now they believe the shit. Right. And Watts showed it. Because it served his purpose of saying, look what happens. Like you said, when one of these clown actors gets involved in our business, but nobody else, it, it wasn't going to make them any money and they didn't have a hard on to show it just to prove that the guy really got hurt. So that's why it didn't air anywhere else. But Watts showed it to make people more believe in wrestling. And, and I'm still gobsmacked that the most preposterous angle with the most ridiculous looking person andy kaufman was the most legitimate looking and perceived angle done in wrestling on a mainstream basis for the fucking next two or three decades and it wasn't in, it, a lot of people still believed it until the movie how many nwa world title changes actually aired in all the territories because i can think of ones well, that didn't like when flair lost to carry von eric that didn't air. I mean, it aired in a lot of places where world class aired, but a lot of territories didn't air the actual match or footage of the match. Well, let's let's go down the list. After 1977, Toronto race and funk that did air and that was taped. Um, the the change in uh, in '81, the change is well, even before that, the Baba changes didn't air in America. Well, but you can't expect them to. Well, it was in the magazine, so I guess you should just at least say that they didn't air here. Well, they, yeah, they did not air because that was basically Baba with Briscoe and with uh, Harley, right? Had twice with Harley, twice with <laughs> Harley, had come up with the amount of money that it you know that it took to get the NWA to say, okay, you can have it for a week or two while Harley's in Japan, and that made everybody happy. But of United States-based title changes. They aired, obviously, both Dusty and Flair in the Carolinas. But they, the NWA knew at the start that Dusty was going to be a short-term champion. And I'm sure it probably aired in fucking St. Louis or whatever. Um, Georgia. Georgia, uh, yeah. Georgia for Flair and for Dusty. And also St. Louis. Um, and then, here's the thing. After that, it started getting, you know, a little territorial to where, yes, when it was convenient, when the NWA champion was coming in for dates, the particular territory might air the title change. But it was Starcade 83 and, and, um, and then pretty much Jim Crockett had a hold of the belt and you could get title defenses for a few years, but nobody else was getting a title change. And the other TVs, you know, the other promoter started realizing this. It was like, well, why are we promoting his fucking guy? So there, uh, in the six, in the fifties and sixties, I believe if the, if the technology had existed and the wherewithal to send this out multiple copies easily, et cetera, et cetera, probably every time the title changed, you would have seen it on television. But by the time the eighties came around and easier transport of video, not film and et cetera, um, it was starting to get too territorial. All right. I think we tackled that topic. Well, here's a topic that we can cover. If you've been stressed out by all the, the things that we've just said and tearing your hair out and, and you need somebody to talk to, to sort this all out, our friends at BetterHelp. Folks, BetterHelp, without doubt, has been one of the, our longstanding sponsors here on the program. We've had so much feedback from so many of the Cult of Cornet followers and listeners that have said they've been helped by speaking to somebody at BetterHelp. It's not self-help. It's not a crisis line. It's professional counseling done securely online with a broad range of expertise. You can log on to your account anytime, send messages, and receive them from your counselor. 
You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, no waiting rooms, no going out in public, no encountering the 7,000 variants of COVID. The folks at BetterHelp are committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. They make it easy and free to change counselors if you need, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. So BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Remember, it's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. If you go to betterhelp.com slash J-C-E, then you can get 10% off your first month's services. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Folks, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and experienced listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash J-C-E.